Next, we get to hear from Dr. Rachel morello Frosch, who is a professor at UC Berkeley and a world expert in environmental health and environmental justice. We just heard that your neighborhood predicts your BMI. If you want to know someone's toxic load of chemical exposures, you need to know their, where they live, but also these other factors, like their uh, poverty level. So Rachel studies this double jeopardy that people of color, people of low income are exposed to more chemicals and they're more vulnerable because of stress, discrimination, malnutrition. So this is one of the most important topics. If you want to talk about big prediction of percent variance, look at Rachel's work. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I want to start out with a story. When I was uh, a young professor at Brown University, I was teaching a service learning course. And um, my students wanted to develop an environmental curriculum for two high schools in, Pro, uh, in the suburbs and uh, in Providence, Rhode Island. So they decided to do a survey of the kids to kind of figure out where they were on uh, what they thought about the environment and how they conceptualized it. Um, so there were two high schools, uh, one called the Met School and another one in Barrington, Rhode Island, which is a suburb, predominantly white and affluent. So they asked them a very simple question, what do you think your, the top three environmental problems are in your opinion? So the kids in Barrington listed things like climate change, air pollution, and lack of biodiversity. Um, and the kids in the Met School, which were predominantly kids of color, working class kids, who lived in uh, Rhode Island, listed, there were some commonalities there. there were, climate change, uh, there was concern about uh, toxic waste sites from a lot of the in abandoned industries there. And their last uh, top three, uh, their third environmental problem was the cops. Um, so I just want to thank people for inviting me here today and for uh, conceptualizing broadly how we think about the socio-exposome. And I want to emphasize with this chart that you see here, which is looking at demographic project, uh, projections for the United States. And as you can see, and California is already here, um, we are becoming uh, a, st a state that's uh, a, a country that's becoming much more diverse uh, from a racial, ethnic perspective, and now economic perspective, and in terms of our immigration experience. And this has, I think, shifted the conversations that we have about public health and environmental policy making and what constitutes environmental problems. We have been forced as scientists to broaden our notions about what constitutes the environment and how it impacts health. Um, and so this notion of the social exposome, I think, is very apropos. Um, so I like to talk about uh, triple, I talk, it, was, it was double jeopardy and now I call it triple jeopardy, but um, thinking about this notion of triple jeopardy and how it shapes what I like to conceptualize as environmental risk scapes. We can't lose sight of our social context. Um, I think uh, Barbara's uh, display of increasing stress uh, sort of uh, makes that point even more important. So social context of in, uh, social inequality, racial segregation, um, discrimination, and that has ebbs and flows in societies in which we live. Uh, and then who you are in terms of how you identify or how you're perceived racially, ethnically, in terms of your immigration status, affects how that social uh, context impacts you. And that can uh, affect where we live, work, and play, and the kinds of things that we're exposed to in the environments in which we move every day, whether it's disparities in exposures to environmental chemicals, air pollution, drinking water, and then the social vulnerability factors, which you see in the box in the middle, those are things that are modifiable by public policy, what we call extrinsic factors, things like poverty, food insecurity, things that Barbara covered in her talk, race, racism, gender roles, and discrimination. And then on the far right, the biological susceptibility factors, which I think as public health people and regulatory agencies, we have tended to focus more on, and now we're trying to shift the focus more on that middle box. Uh, but age, malnutrition, our genetics, and sex, these things can come together and interact with each other and are drivers of the persistence of disparities in chronic diseases, including obesity. So I work a lot with communities to address environmental health challenges, and these are sort of pictures that uh, colleagues have taken. This is in Richmond, California. This is what we talk about when we talk about the environmental risk scape. 
Um, as you can see in the top, Liberty and Atchison Village, which is a Rosie of the Riverter historical site, is very close to, it's a working class neighborhood. It was built during the war period. And it's very close to the refinery, two freeway corridors, and multiple um, emission sources. And then for those of you who are from Los Angeles, um, this is the 710 freeway, and this is a billboard indicating what the community thinks about how it's impacting their health. Uh, so when we talk about social context, one thing that um, I like to study a lot is the effect of social inequality on the ways and how it shapes how communities are exposed to environmental hazards. And I'm starting to broaden my definition of those. This is a map of the United States which uh, shows uh, multi-group uh, segregation in over 300 metropolitan areas of the country. So the places that are in deepest red are the ones that are considered hyper-segregated where about 60% uh, of people uh, within that metro area would have to get up and move in order to achieve an even distribution of the people that live there. So we care about this because uh, it can affect, for example, racial disparities and exposures to environmental hazards. And I looked at it first a long time ago using a great um, data set available from US EPA called the National Air Toxics Assessment. Um, uh, way back when, I was actually an intern for Tracy Woodruff at the US Environmental Protection Agency, which got me access to that data. Um, and so this chart uh, shows you ba basically um, levels of exposure by race for uh, known probable or possible carci carcinogenic air toxics in the ambient air. And each one of those lines represents a racial or ethnic group as defined by the U.S. Census. And then I've uh, segregate, uh, stratified the data by the level of segregation of neighborhoods in terms of the city in which they're in. So uh, neighborhoods that are in highly segregated cities are on the far right, and neighborhoods that are in the least segregated cities are on the left. And so there's two take-home messages from this chart. One is, not surprisingly, racial disparities and exposures to carcinogenic air toxics is much greater in more segregated cities. But the other take home message, which I think is interesting, is that air quality is worse overall for people who live in more segregated cities. So if you look at the blue line, which represents white residents, white residents who live in more segregated cities are much worse off than their uh, white counterparts who live in less segregated cities. So there's something about inequality in of itself that can degrade the environment for everybody. In cities, it probably has to do with the fact that in more segregated places, people have to drive further distances to access things like their jobs and basic services. So um, we're interested in this group about the developmental origins of disease, and we think a lot about the intrauterine environment. And increasingly, we're starting to try and understand, in response, I think, to um, public demand, how environmental and social stressors during pregnancy can disproportionately affect perinatal and developmental outcomes in offspring. Um, so there's a lot of really good literature out there that shows us relationships between air pollution and uh, low birth weight. Um, those tend to be strongest among African American women and low income women. We also, uh, there's some very good literature out there to suggest the neurological impacts of prenatal exposures to environmental chemicals, including air pollution, that are strongest for women who report severe material deprivation while they're pregnant, i.e. they reported having trouble paying bills and putting food on the table while they were pregnant. Um, more recent literature showing, for example, um, that exposures to environmental chemicals and air pollution can affect hormonal levels that affect the fetus. So there was a, a study last uh, this past week from USC showing that air pollution affected thyroid uh, hormone levels uh, in the fetus. New areas of environmental exposures that we're becoming increasingly more interested that are about environmental exposures but that are also very highly linked to stress are things like noise. Um, so this is a map of nighttime noise levels uh, in the United States, and not surprisingly, uh, the red places are often where are highly urbanized areas. So we focused on uh, disparities in noise levels in urban areas in the country, um, in, er in metropolitan areas. And again, we looked at this question also of racial disparities and exposures to nighttime noise and the extent to which segregation <coughs> impacted those levels overall. So on the left, you can see that as the proportion of whites in a neighborhood increases, the nighttime noise levels in their neighborhood decreases. While on the right-hand side, you see that the opposite trend is uh, for um, African-American residents in neighborhoods. As, a, as the proportion goes up, nighttime noise goes up. And again, you see a separate segregation effect. 
Segregation makes it worse for everybody. So even if you look among whites, whites, the blue line, the least segregated whites are much better off than whites that are living in more segregated cities. Green space, another thing that people are concerned about in terms of associations with obesity, the ability to be physically active, not to mention just being around green space itself can reduce, um, improve mental health outcomes. Also, with climate change, we're worried about green space exposure, and we want more green space because it can reduce heat island effects, particularly in urban areas. So we've been interested in the extent to which the color line might be reflected in the proportion of green space in people's neighborhoods. Um, and this is also something that is modifiable by public policy. Um, so for example, if you look at this chart, um, this is looking at LA, Sacramento, San Diego, and San Francisco, and we asked the question, um, what do we see in terms of the proportion of green space, which is represented by the green bars, and the proportion of impervious surface, which can increase heat islands, which is represented by the brown bars, do we see differences when the proportion of people of color living in the neighborhood increases? And again, for every city, we can see that as the proportion of people of color residents in the neighborhood increases, we see more impervious surface and less green space across the major metropolitan areas in um, uh, California. So that's you know kind of uh, a bit of a downer to some of this news um, that we've been talking about, but. There's, I think, lots of implications uh, to, uh, to address action, and I think communities that are impacted by these environmental exposures have really pushed the regulatory communities and scientists like myself to say, yep, you gotta do better science, but we don't wanna wait around to do something until you nerds figure it out what, what you're gonna do. Um, and so, uh, as a result, Cal EPA um, and um, other groups like um, my team have worked to, how do, we, how do we develop mapping tools to integrate place level measures of environmental and social stressogens that can highlight neighborhoods of potential regulatory concern? So we're very fortunate in California, it's very action oriented, um, and um, the Cal EPA's Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment has spent a lot of resources to develop what is known as Cal Enviro Screen, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Um, and it does precisely that. It maps place-based indicators of both environmental and social stressors um, that we can see and then target um, areas for regulatory concern. And I would add that um, OEHA did a lot of uh, community engagement and public comment period to get buy-in from a bunch of different stakeholders and community members um, to, in the development of this tool, and they keep doing it every time they update it. So these are the kinds of indicators uh, that you see in Cal Enviro screen. They include exposures to environmental hazards, uh, uh, regulatory data on what we know about uh, environmental effects, and then on the other side, population characteristics that might highlight vulnerable uh, communities. Uh, related to underlying health conditions and then socioeconomic factors related to things like neighborhood deprivation uh, that Barbara was talking about. So this is a great tool. The question is, all that work, many of us um, helped contribute to that. Um, what do we use it for? Well, um, this is where I think um, forward thinking and systems thinking can really help us start to address these things even as we sort out things scientifically. One of the great things about California is we have a climate change law. <laughs> and we're moving forward on it really fast. Um, and oh, by the way, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, so that has a huge um, impact. So one of the things that's related to this climate ch change law is that uh, now that industry is regulated and has to pay for uh, greenhouse gas emissions through a cap and trade program, um, a lot of communities came together to create a greenhouse gas reduction fund. It requires that a portion of that revenue uh, that comes from regulation of industrial greenhouse gas emissions be invested in precisely those uh, vulnerable and disadvantaged communities that are overwhelmed by environmental and social stressors to address climate change and mitigate it and also so that they can benefit from the co-pollution reductions as a result of those investments. And so uh, this has been um, a, a process by which environmental justice advocates have worked very closely with the regulatory community to develop the legislation and to implement it. You can look online to see where these investments are actually happening, but Cal Enviro Screen is used as a way to identify those communities uh, for where those that are good places to do those investments. Finally, I would add that 
climate change policies um, and have actually starting to address some of the health concerns that we're talking about today, and sometimes in ways that we wouldn't normally expect. So in, um, in, during a 10-year period, there was a closure of uh, 10 power plants in the state of California, and many uh, uh, reasons because uh, many of the uh, companies that own these plants saw the writing on the wall uh, around climate change policies, and they were going to no longer be economically uh, feasible to run. Two of them were coal-fired power plants. Um, so uh, my collaborator, uh, who's a postdoc in my lab, led a really interesting study, which was, this is a natural experiment. Can we uh, see what the health, short-term health impacts are with these power plant closures? And uh, what we saw was that um, the power plant retirements were associated with nearly a 2% reduction in preterm births in the communities that live nearby. Now, I could say that if somebody invented a drug that reduced preterm birth by 2%, it would be considered a blockbuster. So um, the other thing we saw was um, a signal that uh, indicated that the closures also led to, um, was associated with increase in f fertility rates as well. So, um, and we also saw um, stronger effects uh, for um, African American and Asian mothers in terms of the benefits and the reductions in preterm birth um, in that study. So I just want to close by saying that, um, you know, the news out there is scary. It can seem really overwhelming. I think the key to kind of moving forward, I think as Tracy said in her talk, is really engaging with communities and the public who are really uh, passionate about these issues and particularly engaging them in the regulatory science process, whether it's the development of things like Calenviro Screen and legislation for investing funds to address environmental and social stressors. And all of that, I think, can enhance the, uh, the relevance and the reach of the scientific work that we're doing so that we're not only doing translational research, but ultimately we're doing transformational research for concrete policy change and addressing both environmental and social stressors and improving community health. Thank you. <laughs>